Hi there everyone, Bruno Luce here and in this clip I'm going to show you how to operate our Sennheiser Evolution 100 wireless system. This wireless system is quite old as far as electronic components go. The transmitters and receivers are in some cases well over 10 years old but they are still working fine and they have given us many years of good service. So follow along and I'll show you how to set these things up. Now before we start dealing with how to connect the wireless system, it's important to realize that all wireless systems consist of two components, a transmitter and a receiver. And you can see the ones in St. George's here. Here you can see the three types of microphones that we deal with in our wireless system. To begin with, right at the top you can see we have a handheld transmitter. Now this of course combines the microphone and the transmitter into one unit and it's designed to be held uh, like a regular microphone. These are, we have two of them and they are both dynamic cardioid microphones, so similar to in sound to the SM58, but not exactly the same. We then have, as you can see here, this is called a body pack transmitter, and it has a clip on the back which allows the person to either wear it on their belt or clip it to the inside of a pocket. The clip can be taken off if necessary if you want the pack to be a bit more low profile. Now, obviously this is just a transmitter, it doesn't yet have a microphone. There's a socket on top here where you plug the mic in. We have two varieties of what are called lavalier or clip-on microphones. Now, as you can see, the cardioid is physically quite a bit bigger than the Omni and they use different styles of clip. The Omni has a metal clip and the cardioid has this uh, plastic clip. You can clearly see the difference in design. Now if you look closely at the cardioid, you can see that there is a center band here and that there is a grill both above and below it. This rear grill is what gives the cardioid mic its pattern. In other words, this rear interference port is what cancels the sound that comes from the back of the mic. The Omni has a front grill, but as you can clearly see, it has no rear grill, and that's what makes it an Omni. The differences between the two are threefold. First of all, the cardioid accepts sound from the front, but is deaf from the rear. The Omni accepts sound from all directions. Now what this means is that the cardioid has to be aimed correctly. If you are in a situation where it no longer points at the person's mouth, you will get either no sound or you'll get an extremely muddy signal which will not be useful. The Omni on the other hand is relatively insensitive to aim and in many television studios you'll actually see that they're mounted upside down pointing downwards and still give a perfectly decent signal. Now, why don't we use the Omni all the time? Well, the reason is that because the Omni accepts sound from all directions, it's much more susceptible to feeding back than the cardioid. In fact, I would recommend that unless you really know what you're doing, do not use the Omni in a sound reinforcement situation. In other words, if you have live loudspeakers, stick with the cardioid and make sure it is aimed correctly because with the Omni, especially if you have a softly spoken person, you will often not be able to get it loud enough before it feeds back. The other thing, of course, is that the cardioid has what is called proximity effect. The closer you get to the microphone, the bassier the sound gets. The Omni, on the other hand, does not exhibit this property. So if you are doing a recording, or if you are doing something which does not involve live microphones, like this video, for instance, it's better to use the Omni. The Omni does sound more natural, 
but as I've said, it's less useful when you have live loudspeakers around. Next, we're going to look at how you insert batteries into the wireless transmitters. Both of them take 9 volt batteries, as you can see here. Uh, we recommend Energizer or Duracell. You must use alkaline batteries. Do not use uh, zinc carbon batteries because they will die in a very short period of time. The uh, body pack transmitter first. The battery door is here. In order to open this, you press down with your thumb and you open the battery compartment. It does take a certain amount of force to do this and don't be afraid you won't break it. Uh, right at the bottom you can see that the polarity is marked correctly so the positive pole goes on the left and the negative goes on the right. If you insert the battery wrongly it won't hurt the transmitter, it just won't switch on and in certain situations this can make you think you've got a dead battery. So uh, you put it in if there's already a battery in there, you just shake it out and insert your new one. Press all the way down and then clip it shut. Right? When it's shut, it will not protrude out of the casing. With the handheld transmitter, you have to unscrew the end of the transmitter and you can see the battery there. Now they have actually given you a finger slot on the other side so what you do is you, you put your finger in there and you pop the battery out like that okay uh, make sure it doesn't fly across the room and injure somebody now as you can see the battery poles there are clearly marked so the negative pole goes uppermost you put it in and then you can reassemble the transmitter now, Sennheiser, in their wisdom, have set this up such that if you insert the battery backwards, the transmitter will not actually close, right? It will not. Now, if this happens, don't force it, whatever you do, you will break it. Okay, so just take the battery out, put it back in the right way. This is a bit fiddly. And then screw the transmitter all the way home. There should not be a silver gap here when the transmitter is screwed shut. Next thing we're going to look at is the control screens of the transmitters. Now this is the body pack transmitter. As you can see there are four buttons and a mute switch. The mute switch is off in this position and when it's at the word mute there is no output from the transmitter. This is so that the operator can mute it if they desire. Make sure that this is not in the mute switch when you give the transmitter to the person who's going to be wearing it. The red button is the on-off button. In order to switch the transmitter on, you have to hold this down and the transmitter powers up. Initially, it will show you the frequency that it's assigned to. Now, when the transmitter turns on, you can see that this red light comes on. If it is flashing, your battery is low. Steady red means your battery is okay. Now this is in contrast to a number of other manufacturers who have a different system of indicating low battery. But for these, remember, steady red is okay, flashing red low battery. Obviously, if there's nothing, it means either no battery or dead battery. Below the power switch, you have set. When you press this, it actually allows you to change the frequency of the channel as well as set different parameters. So you press once, um, sensitivity, uh, usually for body packs, if the speaker is a very soft-spoken person, you will set it to zero. To confirm, you press the set button. Um, if you have somebody who is quite loud, uh, you'll set it to minus 10. Uh, shouting or screamy type people, uh, set it to minus 20. The minus 30 dB setting 
is used in conjunction with line level inputs to the transmitter. So, for example, if you have an electric guitar plugged into this, you would set it to minus 30. Uh, the minus 30 setting is not used with microphones. So, we'll put it back to minus 10. Right? Again, press set to confirm. The, if you press it twice, uh, display, so it will ask you what you want to display. You can display the frequency of operation, uh, what channel it's set to, and those are your choices. So we'll leave it set to frequency. Uh, press it three times. This allows you to fine tune the actual frequency that it's set to. And uh, you can do that with the up and down buttons. We won't do that now. If you press it three times, you will arrive at lock. And if you select lock on and press this again, you will lock the transmitter, meaning that this will not work. And more importantly, the power button will not work. To take the lock off, you press set once and then deactivate lock. Press set once again. All right. So to summarize, sensitivity, display, tune, lock, and back to home screen again. Now these two buttons on the right of the screen are used to change your preset frequency. So you can go down to a lower frequency or you can go up to a higher frequency. Now when the display is flashing, it's flashing to indicate the fact that you have changed the frequency from what it was originally set. In order to confirm, you press set and it will stop flashing. And that's changed to your new frequency. Um, if on the other hand, you don't wish to change, you simply change back to your original and it will stay there. So I'm going to set it back to this. And that's your belt pack transmitter. To turn off, hold this down and it will indicate off. Now with the handheld transmitter, the controls are actually located on the end here. This is quite an interesting system which is unique to Sennheiser. And as you can see here, they have this rotating collar, which is useful because when it's set to this position here, none of the switches are exposed and you can see the indicators for power and clip. So, to turn the mic on, you rotate the collar to this position and hold down the button. Right? Um, once you do that, the screen will show your frequency. Now if you continue to rotate the collar, you will expose uh, three sets of buttons here. These work in, a, in exactly the same way as the buttons on the belt pack transmitter. So pressing set allows you to change the sensitivity, frequency and lock or unlock the transmitter. So I won't go through that. If you continue to turn the collar, you'll arrive at mute. White dot means muted and that is unmuted. Continue to turn it and that is the safe position. Uh, if you want to prevent people from meddling with this, it's quite simple. You just put a piece of tape here and it's quite effective in stopping them from meddling with that. To turn off, return the collar to this position and hold down that button. And as you can see, it's off. The other part of any wireless system, of course, is the receivers. And here are our receivers. The unit at the top, which has no screen, is an antenna splitter, which allows one pair of antennas to feed all four receivers. There are four receivers, as you can see. There is an additional one, which is not here, but is in the drawer in the vestry, which is used either as a spare or as a mobile unit. Our wireless system is what is called a diversity system. If you can see, it says diversity receiver there. What this means is, is that each receiver is actually two separate receivers, each of which has one antenna. 
This greatly reduces the likelihood of dropouts because if the path from the transmitter to one of the antennas is interrupted, the system automatically switches over to the other antenna. In fact, the system is constantly switching back and forth depending on which signal is better. This is much better than the older non-diversity systems where even if they had two antennas, there was still only one receiver. And as a result of this, they would drop out if the transmission path was interrupted. Now the very first thing that you should do before you turn on the receivers is you have to connect these. Now, if you've seen these lying near the choir mixer, they are not for self-defense in case the congregation riots as a result of your bad mixing. They are in fact the antennas for the wireless system. And if you do not connect them, the wireless system won't work very well. So there is one antenna at each end of the mixing desk. This is the first one. The other one is on the other side near the choir mixer. Down here, tucked in underneath here, you'll find this cable. Now this cable goes to the antenna splitter and you take this and you connect it to the antenna itself. Now as you can see here in this close-up, the antennas themselves use an unusual connector. This is called a BNC or bayonet nut connector. It's not used anywhere else in our PA system, but it is quite common on higher end video connections. So in order to connect this, you need to line up the, the cutouts in the connector, as you can see. You have to line those up with the lugs, then the whole thing will push on and you turn the locking ring until it clicks right? and then the connector will be secure. To unlock, you turn the locking ring the other way and it comes off. Now once your antennas are connected, you can proceed to switch the receivers themselves on. As I mentioned, there are four of them and the power supply comes from the supply to the PA system. So if the PA system is not on, the receivers will not have power. What you do is you hold the button down and the receiver comes on. Do the same for all of them. And they have this nice green screen. Now here you can see a close-up of one of the screens of the receivers. At the top there are RF and AF indicators RF stands for radio frequency and AF stands for audio frequency. As the transmitter is now, you can see that it is not detecting any transmitters. As soon as the respective transmitter is switched on, there, you will see that the display has changed and now you have both an RF check one two as well as an AF so if I speak into the microphone you can see it's indicating that there is audio signal if I mute the transmitter you can see that the audio indicator disappears unmute the transmitter and there it is again below that the display displays the frequency that the transmitter and receiver are set to and in the bottom right hand corner of the screen you can see a Roman numeral that shows which antenna the transmitter is using. In this case it's antenna 2. Now in the event that you see the RF at less than 40 this actually means that you have not connected those two antennas that I showed you earlier. The RF in our church should always remain at 40. It should never drop below that. If it drops to only 15 or 20, it means either you haven't connected your antennas or there's something wrong with the receiver and it needs servicing. 
The actual controls on the receiver itself is quite simple. Um, using these buttons, you can change the frequency that the receiver is set to. So if you press up, uh, it will go to a higher frequency. And if you press down, it will actually go to a lower frequency. Now, each receiver has four pre-programmed frequencies and they're a little bit different for each one. So it's best not to change these, but leave them set as they are. The frequencies are as follows. For radio one, it's 519.600. For radio 2, it's 520.525. For radio 3, it's 521.550. And for radio 4, it's 522.725. It's best not to change these as the transmitters and receivers have been set to work together using these frequencies. The next step after you have your antennas hooked up, your transmitters switched on, and your receivers receiving the transmitters is to actually physically connect the receivers to the mixing console. With this mixing console, we don't have enough channels to keep the receivers hooked up all the time, so you've got to do it yourself whenever you need to use the wireless. Now you can see here there are four red cables that emerge from the left side of the mixer and they are labeled radio 1, 2, 3 and 4 and these are the outputs from the receivers themselves. Now once you've identified the connector for the receiver that you are actually using, in this case it was radio 2, you connect it to a line input on any of the channels. I usually prefer to use one that is closer to the uh, left-hand end of the console. So let's say we choose channel 2 and then you are ready to set the gain as you would on any other input channel. The receiver outputs a line level signal so typically you'll be looking at a gain of round about 11 o'clock or so depending on how loud the person speaking is. In order to know how to set the gain, please watch my other video on gain setting procedure. At this point, you're almost done. You've connected your antennas, you've switched on your receivers, you've switched on your transmitters, you've made sure that your transmitters and receivers are connecting, and you've connected your receivers to the mixing console and set your gain. The most important step of this whole wireless procedure is probably the positioning of the lavalier mics. Now, how do you position these? The best advice that I can give you is to make sure that it is about where the person's chin touches their chest. So what you do is this. You get them to put their chin on their chest, I know it sounds funny, and you put the microphone just below that point. What this does is it prevents the microphone from being in the acoustic shadow of their chin, which will lead to quite a muffled sound. Now to finish off this demonstration, I thought that I'd let you hear the sound of the three different types of microphones that we have in the wireless system. This is the sound of the handheld transmitter. As you can hear, it sounds quite a bit like an SM58, although with a different quality to the mid-range. So this is the sound of the Evolution 100 cardioid dynamic handheld transmitter. Carrying on, this is the sound of the cardioid lavalier microphone. Now, as you can hear, it sounds quite natural, but note that it is pointing directly up. There's a couple of problems with using cardioids in this application. First of all, if I turn my head, you can hear that as my head moves, the sound actually changes quite a bit. Okay, this again has to do with the directionality.
The next thing is if I move the microphone, I'm now aiming the microphone to my left, which does sometimes happen. You can hear that the sound changes quite a bit there. Worst come to the worst, the mic will actually get turned completely upside down as in this demonstration and you can hear that the sound quality really suffers. This is the sound if the mic is pinned quite low on my chest and this is the sound if the microphone is actually pinned way up on my collar. As you can hear there is a lack of high frequencies because it is in the acoustic shadow of my chin. So once again, the best position for this kind of microphone is on the chest immediately below where the chin touches. And finally, this is the sound of the omnidirectional microphone. Now you can hear that the omni does not have any proximity effect and for recording, omnis are actually preferable to cardioids. Once again, if I turn my head, you can hear that the variation in the sound as I do so is quite a bit less. And similarly, if I pin the microphone upside down, the sound quality is remarkably consistent. Similarly, with omnidirectionals, it is best not to pin them too high. As you can see in a situation like this, the sound quality is not as distinct because of the acoustic shadow from my chin. And similarly, you don't want to pin them too low because you lose distance from the sound source. Well everyone, that's the video on the Sennheiser Evolution 100 wireless system. I hope it was useful to you. If you have any questions, please contact me either via my YouTube page or on email and I'll do my best to answer them. So until the next time, this is Bruno Luce saying goodbye and see you in church.